For today's programming, it's called Living Library. This is an event where we're able to provide a story for all the women, or part of the women that were part of our um, Black Women and Leadership exhibition. Um, a little bit about the exhibition is that these women that were chosen and invited are women from all different sectors in Toronto um, that have been uh, leading the um, industry that they're in and have been part of community and helping lead um, for future generations. Um, and I'll give it off to Fury. Hi again, everybody. So today we're going to be having Belinda Oase, who is one of the co-curators of the Black Women in Leadership exhibition. <laughs> Belinda is an emerging curator and first-generation Rwandan currently based in Toronto. During her time in Alberta, she held roles with the Art Gallery of Alberta and the youth organization YEG The Come Up, where she led the Arts and Culture Task Force. Belinda was a part of BAN's first iteration of the Curator in Residency program, and currently she serves as a program coordinator for the public arts organization STEPS. She received her bachelor's degree in history and political science from the University of Alberta and strives to use her combined interest in research and curation to engage communities through art. Can we please put our hands together for Belinda and she's going to run us through the rest of the evening. Do you have a mic? Yeah, um, I think I can speak into it, but um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's my honor to be moderating this talk amongst all of these incredible women. Um, again, thank you for being here and um, highlighting a lot of their works. Um, all of them will get a chance to speak and highlight some key um, takeaways from um, their um, Path as community leaders, and so I will start off um, with Corinne, and each speaker will have five minutes to speak, and then we'll go from there. So again, thank you so much, and I'll pass it off to Corinne <coughs> Morin. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope I pack it up in five minutes, so I'm going to read my, my speech. As all of us are here today, as leaders of our communities, I stand beside my favorite color, Sandra, in pink, and my favorite color, Vivian, <laughs> in white. We are all standing on the grounds of our black settlers who paved the way for us today. I grew up in a small town in Quebec as the only black girl on my street, in my neighborhood, in my schools, and in my town. My path and career advancement have not been easy. I have encountered many challenges based on my racialized background and my life circumstances. Racism, in its most vulgar and violent form. These experiences did not stop me from accumulating more than 30 years of experience in community development, working with youth at risk, abused women and children, working with the private sector, managers and business owners, and serving the Francophone community, new immigrants in Canada. <clears throat> when I arrived in Ontario, I surfed couches in Flemington Park, moving to Jane and Finch, then Regent Park. And that is where I raised my two wonderful sons as, single, as a single parent after completing university. My journey is mainly based on my life experience, where I started my first summer job while in high school, painting fire hydrants in my home city, doing modeling, teaching piano, and Arabic dances to disabled children. I transitioned to Toronto to attend York University. No longer wanted to be a surgeon, that's what I wanted to be. I have a degree in women's studies and a minor in languages. Working on campus, I advocated for immigrant Francophone women and organized the 1990, in 1990 the first forum for violence against Francophone women involving the whole family, the husbands and the children, knowing that men and children were also part of the solution. I then began my career through the Canadian legal system at the Victim Witness Assistance Program of the Ministry of Attorney General, 
working mainly with immigrant women who were victims of sexual assaults and domestic abuse. I then participated in the implementation of the first child witness special court at Hull City Hall to hear cases of abused children, and that's a program that now exists in the whole province that's allowing children and women to be and feel safe while giving their testimony. My passion with motivating vulnerable children and managing crisis situations also led me to work as a counselor at Kids Help Phone. That's a 24-hour support line for abused children, where I was intervening in suicide prevention, helping young girls who were otherwise isolated in their community facing violent and sexual abuse. The last 14 years before my appointment as a Justice of the Peace, I worked in the community for several French organizations. I developed programs for youth at risk, developing cultural curric curriculum for volunteers working for the French <clears throat> Women's Crisis Line, as well as organizing, facilitating, and developing a bilingual cultural competencies curriculum to enhance and enrich the learning opportunities for employers and employees, their clients, volunteers, and interns. I have organized large business conferences and training sessions, not only in Ontario and British Columbia, but also overseas in Africa. My community, involve, my community involvement during the last six years prior to my appointment was significant. I was serving in seven board of directors simultaneously as a secretary, as vice president, or president. I served as chair for a couple of health organizations, the French LIN and uh, HIV AIDS organization. I serve on the Canadian Mental Health Association of Peel, the Coalition of Haitian Organizations, the Collège Boreal. I was the co-founder of Le Centre Canadien pour l'Unité de la Famille, and also I was in the advisory committee of the Minister of Francophones Affairs at the time, the Honorable Madeleine Meyer. In 2010, as I was bedridden, I created and led a Haitian coalition to get involved, helping my people in Haiti after the terrible earthquake that killed over 300,000 people. Once giving birth to my amazing third son, I eventually moved to the suburban municipality after finally being able to pay off my student loans and purchasing, purchasing my first home. As I presided as the first black, as I preside today as the first black bilingual justice of the peace in the central west region, and I was told that I was the first black Canadian uh, justice of the peace in Ontario, French speaking, I continue to make a meaningful impact on the communities that I serve by speaking at many, many youth forums, conducting mock trials with students, and speaking at women's conferences. I have continued to be involved in my communities, delivering hot meals for the most vulnerable during the pandemic and creating an organization in Haiti with my husband, providing the most vulnerable in Haiti. I also sit in the evaluation committee of 100 ABC women. Amongst my many awards, I am the most proud of the the Toronto Board of Trade nominations for diversity for opportunities for all, an employment program that I created. My 2015 Career Entrepreneurship Excellence Award from the Haitian Community, the 2020 Changing Lives Award from the International, International Women Achievers Award. I was portrayed in a French special edition publication in Ontario. Being an honoree of the first edition of the 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women holds a very special, special place in my heart, as Dr. Jean Augustine and Donna Joan Simmons, the two co-founders of that, uh, met at a conference that I organized back in 2012. I am humbled to being part of this 2022-2023 Black Women in Leadership exhibition. All of these accomplishments came to the constant, came with the constant breathing of racism, surviving experience of violence in many forms, and the unconditional love of my children, the added love of my daughters-in-laws, and my grandson, and now my husband. As painful as some of these experiences were, it, it is these scars that I see in my picture today. And these scars are so meaningful in my successes, and they are shaping my decisions in court every day. Thank you. Thank you 
you so much, Corinne. Um, I just want to remind everyone we have five minutes. I just want to ensure we have time for questions at the end. Um, I'll be queuing you when you have one minute left. Um, next up is Jacqueline. Okay, hi Thank everybody. You. My name's Jacqueline Walters, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna go. <laughs> um, everyone can yeah. hear me okay? All right. Oh, yeah? Okay, great. So, um, I am um, a many things, but my involvement in this exhibition is as a, as a, a kickboxer and an international kickboxing referee. So, how did I get there? Um, okay, <laughs> so there's two components to how I view myself as a, as a black woman and a leader. One is in survival mode, and the other one is very deliberate and uh, distinct and decided in, in my movement. So when I talk about survival mode, in the 1980s when I was 20, in my 20s, I was in a management role in corporate, in the corporate world. And some of the things that I experienced would be considered by today's standards as major monumental macro aggressions, okay? Now we deal with microaggressions. Macroaggressions, for example, being that I was in my 20s, a black woman walk into a meeting that is all black, all white, white males, and having somebody loudly exclaim, oh, here comes some color into the room, greeted by laughter. Um, I also, in a meeting environment, a corporate environment, had someone say to me, oh, you didn't sound black on the phone. Mm -hmm. So macroaggressions, what we got today is not so bad, mm -hmm. microaggressions. We're getting there, slowly but surely. Another thousand years, we'll be fine. So um, I found that when I was a person in my 20s, um, I didn't really have any role models. I grew up in Burlington. I was the only white kid. I, Oh, you mean I'm black? Oh my god. No, I'm sorry. I was the only black child in, in my grade, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, so I actively set out to find opportunities for me to be a role model. I got involved in mentorship programs. The YMCA had a, a black mentorship program that helped inner city kids uh, because I had a role that there were not many women that were young and black in management. Fast forward to many years later, and now I say I'm very deliberate in what it is that I'm doing because as a, a kickboxing official, so I, I actually start, was a fighter and wanted to be an athlete and make the Olympics and all the rest, that didn't happen. So now my goal is I can still make the Olympics right. as an official. So I am currently in Canada, I am Canada, one of Canada's several chief officials Kickboxing is, yeah, you punch and kick people, but it doesn't matter the sport, okay? So I'm, I'm sure if you think of any sport, uh, whether professional or amateur, you don't see a lot of women that are coaches, um, captains, officials, etc. And certainly in professional sports, it's news when someone makes a coaching position, etc. So when I, so kickboxing in Europe is what hockey is in Canada. Okay, so it's very Eurocentric. Needless to say, the first time I showed up in Europe uh, as, a, as a kickboxing official, I was not welcomed. I was, a, I was not only a Canadian, so North American wasn't, was bad enough, but I was also a woman and I'm black. So I actually had to deal with, it was very much like high school. There was a cool crowd and I wasn't part of the cool crowd. Very cliquish. I, it took six years for me to get my A-level certification, which is the highest certification you can get with the World Association of Kickboxing Organizations, which is Olympic san IOC sanctioned. We are going to the Olympics, hopefully within the next few years. Hopefully you see me center ring, okay? So the, the, the goal is, is that... Um, One minute. Thank you. That there was only, I'm the only person, the only woman of color that you will see in the ring uh, officiating fights. I am one of only a handful of people of color that is in the ring. And so when it comes time for the Olympics, I represent Canada, I represent us, I represent, you know, the sport. Um, and I'm, so I'm hoping, I'm working very hard to make sure that I'm selected to be one of the officials at that point. I'll be pretty old by then, but anyway. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and I'll wrap it up there.
Thank you so much. I'll cue the next speaker, Mabinti Dennis. Hello, everyone. My name is Mabinti Dennis. And um, just a few things. Oh, OK. I thought I had a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I work with kids, so you need to be loved. Um, <clears throat> um, so just a few things about me. My journey belong, b began um, a way back when I was a teenager, first came to Canada, attending high school. And um, when I got, in, uh, got into uh, um, high school just before university, there was a lot of racism and I was really afraid of going to college or going forward. So I got involved with um, Fran, the late Fran Endicott, Jean Augustine, um, Akua Benjamin, and many others who had started the first um, uh, black heritage program at, we were, they were starting the first black heritage program at uh, Toronto District School Board. So that there, there was my first volunteer work. And um, I didn't know what I was doing. I just uh, went and I was making the phone calls, uh, calling everybody, reminding them of the meetings, and uh, showing up and uh, making the coffee and setting up the chairs. And that was my volunteer work. And those were my mentors, those were my teachers, and those were my supporter. I later, um, uh, while in college and university, became a, a, a member of the Black Women Black Women's Collective and the Congress of Black Women um, that is very big now and done a lot of work in the community um, over several years. So those were my, my uh, graduation from, you know, I consider to be a, a young mentor and a volunteer in, my, in the community and that's how I start community work. I did go back to, uh, when I finished college and university, I got into community development and started to work in community development in the childcare field and the social service fields. Some of the highlight, things that I'd like to highlight it was I am one of the founder of a Yegbo cultural program, a cultural program for uh, black youths that ran every summer for about uh, all of summer, July and August, and um, where um, we applied for funding through the different arts, arts organization, myself uh, as the administrator and others who I pulled in with me. And um, we ran a program for youth for several years in the community that did really, really well, um, I thought. I still see some of those kids and they're still in the, um, in the arts doing something. So that's really um, a contest to uh, the program supported people. People, uh, young people. Um, I also work in the immigrant se sector. I remember at Cost Immigrant Services when a lot, lot of refugees were coming to Canada, and that was another work that I did where I um, was a settlement worker, and I developed many programs in there um, around employment, around um, uh, getting people support, um, different type of support, helping children to register and get into school when they first arrive, arrive in Canada, and I worked with all different people of all different races, and it was a wonderful work, and that was one, again, of a very interesting job that I really liked a lot. Um, another key um, uh, position I'd like to speak about is my work at Native Child and Family Services. Um, I worked there for 16 years, and in my 12 years, um, I did a research for them in one particular area where there were a lot of Native people. Like, I was going there because I was going to school meetings and, and so forth, and I see... Uh, okay. And I saw a lot of uh, people in, in that community, and I developed a res I did a research, um, did a feasibility study, and um, ran some programs in the community. We went dormant for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden, we were, we, it was inspired by the organization to start a, a, a center out there. So now we have the Mount Dennis Com uh, Community Center. And that work also uh, was inspired by what I did and the research that I did, and 
I, I say this because I want um, young people to know that there's different uh, communities that we can work in, that we can spread ourselves around and do different work and get different kinds of experience. And that was an interesting experience for me. And um, presently, one of the things that I'm doing, I founded a Tulsi Mindfulness Pathway and I am working on uh, working in the black community, actually, um, bringing mindfulness um, and not so much meditation, but mindfulness to children and youths. Um, we started the first um, full day mindfulness program last summer at a Dinker farm where children come up for a day and just do a day of mindfulness. So look out for us. We're coming back this year. And so um, the, the, the program that I do and I like about what we're doing at Tulsi Pathway is everything we do is, is cultural. It is based on Kwanzaa principle. In terms of the mindfulness piece, it's based on Kwanzaa principle. It's not anything okey pokey and we're not lifting off the ground and flying around or anything like that. We are learning how to be still, how to, uh, how to be mindful in terms of what we do, how we speak, what we say, and how we present ourselves to others and in our community. So it's a really um, um, interesting uh, twist on uh, mindfulness and it is called Tulsi Mindfulness Pathway. I've worked with um, organizations such as the Dinker Farm. Um, if you have never been up there, please look it up and go up, and also with um, African Canadian Cultural Center, and presently um, in mindfulness with Tulsi, we're developing a program for black parents in Peel. So um, that's a bit about me. I'm really pleased to be here and to be a role model because my thing is young people. So I mean, I like everybody, but so I'm hoping that I'm speaking to the young people in the group so that they can see that at some point you too can be in this position. My path, I was inspired by my mother who uh, made all my clothes and taught the girls in the family to sew. So it was a natural segue uh, into fashion. I went to Ryerson Polytechnical Institute, uh, as it was called then. It is now uh, TMU, Toronto Metropolitan University. I studied um, uh, fashion there, and I just uh, transitioned from my part-time job at Eaton's uh, into a management uh, training position. And uh, very um, fortunate for me, I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, leave Eaton's and go to what was called Hazelton Lanes, which was a very mm -hmm. exclusive shopping um, center, and open the first freestanding Yves Saint Laurent boutique in Canada. So that was very exciting for me as a young black woman to be working with uh, designer fashions. So that started my career in fashion. And for 10 years, I bought international designers, the first black woman in Canada, to buy um, international designers. I worked uh, at a store called Creed's that doesn't exist anymore, oh, but it was Toronto's Bergdorf Goodman. I uh, worked at Holt Renfrew, mm -hmm. uh, which was very, very exciting for me. I had the opportunity to bring in the first uh, black designer in Holt Renfrew, it was Patrick Kelly. Mm -hmm. At the time, uh, unfortunately, a very, very talented um, young man, American mm -hmm. from Vickysburg, uh, Mississippi. He took uh, Paris by storm, and mm -hmm. although at the time, he, it wasn't in our budget to uh, bring his collection in. I convinced um, the director to uh, give some extra money so that we could uh, change the budget around. And it came into Holt Renfrew and Patrick Kelly's collections stood beside all the notable European <laughs> designers. So that was very, very exciting for me. At that time at Holt Renfrew, uh, there weren't many um, black people uh, in that position. I was the only one, actually. But I always think you have to um, bring someone up with you. And I made sure I brought a young woman. Her name's Sharon Edwards. Uh, she was working part-time, and she was, uh, had finished her um, fashion career, or fashion education at Sheridan. And she came up to assist me as buyer. So here we were in this beautiful, gorgeous boutique with all the top designers in the world. And I was buying for the boutique all the collections. 
and Sharon, a uh, fellow Jamaican a young woman, was my assistant. So it was really, really exciting. So that was 10 years of my life, and uh, I had my son, who is here, and I'm so glad he just arrived. <laughs> and I decided at the time, I didn't want to travel so much. When you're buying international designers, you're traveling many months of the year. So I stayed home with him, raised him, and I went into fashion styling. And that was 1992, and I've been doing it ever since. And also for 18 years, I've been teaching at the Chang School, which is part of TMU. I've taught fashion styling, and I'm teaching a brand new program called Fashion Innovation. So along the road, there were bumps. Of course, I you know, was subjected to a racism. I remember speaking um, to one of the clients, and uh, she had bought, I think was at the time, $30,000 worth of clothing. And you have to think back. This was in the late 80s. And um, she wanted it all delivered, so I said, well, what, uh, when, are, when can we deliver it? And she said, oh, well, I'm gonna be traveling. Uh, I said, okay, so when can we deliver it? Okay, I should be home so-and-so. And then she stopped, and she looked at me, and she said, well, now you know when to, to send the robbers to my house. <laughs> and I was really shocked by that. I wouldn't have expected. And I said, excuse me, what are you trying to say? And of course, she turned a few shades of red, and she just <laughs> turned the, you know, changed the subject. But you know, I held my head high. I remember my father always telling me from when I was a young girl, Iris, you're a black speck in a glass of milk, but hold your head high. And I always have, and I felt I deserved to be in any space in the world, so whether I was in Paris or London or Milan or New York, I felt comfortable because I felt I'm just as good as anyone else. You know, it's, it's a hard road sometimes, but you have to feel inspired and happy within yourself and strong. And uh, that's uh, a little bit about myself, my career. <laughs> Next speaker is Rosemary Satie. Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a little voice, so I'm going to make sure that you hear me. Um, I'm really honored to be here today to speak to you all and to share a little bit about my story. And I'm doing it on today being uh, International Women's Day. And just this morning, um, my, one of the universities I attended issued, um, I'm installed on another wall. <laughs> I, I am now forming another exhibit. I'm the first woman, uh, first alumnus, to be part of the York University Glendon College's wall of importance. I can't remember what they're calling it. <laughs> um, but I, I mention it because it's coming on the heels of so very many recognitions that I've received this year, this February in particular, um, and it's just been quite amazing, and I'm very grateful for that. But those awards are being issued to me not because I'm um, just whoever you see me as, but because of the reality that I have done a lot of work to make things better for deficits that I could see that impacted not just myself, but my children and my community. And um, there's many things that I've done, but I certainly became very much familiar with how to be the trustee for an organization or an idea um, through a number of community involvements. And I took that information, and I took that dedication, and I took that approach to life, to the work that I did at the Ontario Black History Society. Um, this was not a job I sought, and frankly, it wasn't a job. It was an unpaid volunteer position that I held for over 22 years. So who would do this? Why would anybody hang on to something? And I, hang on is not the right word. 
why would anybody continue to support and keep the doors open to an organization that received little, no federal funding, had 90% at a particularly crucial time in our process reduced, cut, and I wasn't being paid. Why stay there? Well, because when I um, found myself as president, because I was on time for a board meeting, um, I also quickly found out that we almost lost the opportunity to have February as Black History Month recognized because it hadn't been petitioned with the City of Toronto, we love the City of Toronto, um, in time. And um, we didn't know this. I was at home with my third child. I was still nursing. Why, why? So we were able to get that done um, and realizing how precarious this commemoration was. And you have to remember, this is at a time when there was nothing. Saying black in some circles was still a problem. Um, it's still a problem now, but it was really a problem then. Um, we, uh, I, with the board, uh, opted to seek the provincial designation and also continuing to be a trustee for the organization, continuing to brand the OBHS, not me, I provided probably 2,000 black history presentations in schools and community groups, uh, grew the brunch from 95 people to about 1,000, uh, made sure that we did as much as we could, including later the most successful um, business plan and feasibility study for a possible museum of African Canadian history. At any rate, I approached the federal government after the success with the province, and uh, a number of MPs con were considered or thought about it, but it did land with Jean Augustine, who brought it through the House of Commons. So at the same time, I also uh, worked on Emancipation Day, and it took forever, from about 1994 until March of 2021, a number of successive t opportunities for it to almost get there before it was passed as a federal designation. Um, what I learned um, in having no money, in having no staff, and in having a need to make some level of impact was the value of designations. And so just last week, two of the most recent designations I was able to see affected was the recognition of black pioneer, black loyalist Thomas Peters, who ended up um, working in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to gather a group of people ultimately and take them to Freetown. So an African Canadian founded an African settlement because the promise that was made to black loyalists was not fulfilled. And the other designation that I was able to effect last week was for the Jamaican Maroons, who were able um, to fend off the British for years until they were ultimately tricked, captured, or put on ships, brought to Nova Scotia, where they ended up building the Citadel and the government house there. Many of them were also dissatisfied and they also returned, were um, not returned, but um, sought um, to leave Nova Scotia. So I'm, I mentioned this because my life is not just about history, but my life is about, I think in part, um, seeing what was not there, knowing what was not there for myself, knowing what was not there for my parents, knowing what was not there for my children, that was the major impetus when they would come home and tell me about what they were not seeing or what they were facing, and working at a very, working with what I could to make a difference. And I hope that that's what you'll take away from this today. My story of coming to Canada, I came to Canada by mistake. 
I wanted to go to the United States to visit. They turned me down, said I wasn't going to return to Jamaica, and I came to Canada to visit instead. And it was July, it was warm, and I had a ball, met a nice boy, <laughs> and I thought, I've got to come back. When we lived in Jamaica, we studied uh, Canadian history, Canadian, I knew everything about Canada, so said I. I heard about snow, what was snow? So a year later, I was back, and I came back in September, a little colder. And by December, I was crying, what have I done? What have I done? And it took, I would say, over 12 years, 12 long years, before I finally figured out this was home. I remember going home and saying to my mother, Mom, it was good to come home, but I can't wait to go home. And she says, you have left. And my father and my schooling always brought us up that volunteering and giving back was part of what one had to do. And when I came to Canada, that was one of the first things I began volunteering as a big sister. To, and my first child, the mother said, I don't want no nigger looking after my child. And I said, oh, you are in luck, because I've never met such a person in my life. <laughs> and the, the social worker didn't know what to do, and the child said, oh, I want to go with her, and we became good friends. Safe to say, I've never been somebody who feels defined by other people's terminology. When they get to know me, to me, you've met a treasure, and it's your luck if you didn't choose to take advantage. That was how I felt, because I was brought up, my father said, you're a whiting, and I didn't know what that meant, but he said, you are always somebody. Always remember that. And my mother always said, if they're not talking about you, you're nobody. So hey. And um, I came to Canada, went to work at a bank where I used to work in Jamaica, thought I didn't want to live and die in a bank, made a to-do list, pros and cons, went to work at Share Newspaper, met Jackie, went to sell advertising, never sold anything in my life, but my father said, always say yes, you can do it, and I became one of the top salespeople at Share Newspaper, and I was bored, and Arnold said, write a column. Well, I'd never done that, so I wrote a column. What the hell? How hard is that? And then he started a newspaper, and he said, I want you to be managing editor, and I went, what does a managing editor do? I looked up in a book, and I found people, and my philosophy is, yes, you can. I know Barack says it, I believe it. Yes, you can. I couldn't, I couldn't fly a plane, and I couldn't be a, a, a heart surgeon, but anything else, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I went to work at Channel 47. They said, can you edit? And I said, yes. I went home and read up how to edit. I have not attended, I've taken lots of classes. I have a PhD in common sense. <laughs> and I really believe common sense is the most important thing. And the key to making change is to know that you have a voice. I went to work at Harborfront Center, again, by mistake. I, 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 was, I was helping at Ontario Black History Society. They were doing a festival after I left Cher. And I got a job as the publicist. I got five interviews when they asked me, prepare a critical path. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and I called a friend who is a publicist. I said, what is that? She said, oh, Sandra, just put the thing. And I went, ah, that. I got the job. And then Harborfront was where the festival was. And they called me back and said, would you like to work here? And I said, doing what? They said, planning events. We're doing a Caribbean. I went, sure. Didn't have a clue. So my view is, always say yes. I know it's harder nowadays, I know it's harder, but I learned, and Harborfront was one of the most important places for me. I met the world at Harborfront. I went there and I said, this is nice, but you haven't done this, and why is that? And, and they go, what do you wanna do? I went, what do you mean? He says, write me a proposal. I wrote him this wonderful proposal about how much change and blah, 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 and, I had no clue, and they said yes, and he said, we are offering you a job, and he told me how much the money was, I said, not enough. And, I, oh, another thing, always, always bargain, never accept the first thing that anybody gives you, never, 
never because they always start at the bottom and anyway got the wonderful job and had an access committee started, got people involved, started Kumba at Harbor Front, met the world at Harbor Front, was the first person of color across Canada to work for a major arts organization as a programmer. Because when you are not inside, you are not heard. And it was just amazing how things got programmed. And I would say, what about? I remember, this is, I know my time is going, but I remember, I love stories, and I remember somebody saying, well, you people can't MC because you're only used to speaking to your people. Mm. I said, so, uno can talk to everybody, but me can only talk to for myself. <laughs> That got changed pretty soon. I changed things because I opened my mouth. I really believe in that. I always wanted, I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up and I still don't know because I still do, I do so many things. I'm a storyteller because my mother said I never stop talking and I love telling stories and I've told stories to thousands of children across Canada, South Africa and the Caribbean. It was my other little life but volunteering is what got me into places and I urge all of you to think about that and always know you can make a difference. Thanks so much, Sandra. Next speaker is Gloria. <laughs> I need the mic. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm not used to talking about what I do. I am a storyteller, so I wrote a little story for you. Um, I'm a frontline activist, and because you was, you, I'm the type of person that you would see in the front line marching with the protesters in the back, you know. Um, so what I've done, I wrote a little story because I'm not used to talking about what I do. So. Um, I would like to start off with a quote from Audre Lloyd. There is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Born in the 1950s in southern United States into generational poverty with hard working parents, I grew up watching the sharp edge of racism separate my family, erase my family history, and devastate my community. So many of us carry that childhood trauma throughout our journey. For me, those experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, has made me the kind of grown up that I needed when I was a child. I am proud to be included with these wonderful, amazing black women, power. Um, it is a privilege to share my story with you guys. I love to talk, so you can, okay. Um, there has always been a lack of recognition for the work that black women do. But that's what we do, that's who we are. We are the first to speak up when something is not right. We are the first to fight for others. We are the first to say, it's gonna be all right, baby. Those are the words of my grandmother. I am from a group of strong black women. They, were, they weren't strong because they wanted to be. They were strong because they had to be. The black women who raised me not only saved families, but they saved communities. I'm a frontline advocate in Toronto, and I advocate on issues such as anti-black racism, violence against black women and trans folks, protecting seniors and elders, my boyfriend, um, <laughs> poverty and homelessness, police violence against black bodies, and the stigma of black about mental health in the black community. And I can talk about um, mental health. Like Maya Angelou says, still I rise. I am a survivor of childhood depression that comes with the pains of poverty, abuse, and not belonging. I've watched my physical and mental health deteriorate because of my race, because of my sex, because of my class. I lived through medical racism from being given tainted blood to doctors leaving tumors in my stomach that turned into ovarian cancer. So that's why it's important for black women to speak up when you're in those, when you go to the doctor. 
So many things happen to us at one time. So we have to ask ourselves, when do we get that self-care? When do we get to celebrate? When do we grieve? How do we grieve? In a short period, I've lost a sister. Soon after, I lost my grandmother. Then my father, my mother right when I started treatment. Another sister right after I finished treatment. I was given five years to live, but I'm still here. So when do I grieve? When do we grieve as black women? Now I'm three months away from being cancer free for five years. Hey. But I never stop I never stop I never stop to feel sorry for myself because I know there's always young black women out here who needs to hear my story. And reaching out to young black girls is what I do best. I know how it feels to be excluded and made to feel unlovable. I want to be remembered not just for my art, but for my compassion. My message to you today, my sisters, if you can lift someone up, lift them up. If you can give a word to encourage, to empower someone, give that word. There is, I'm almost done. There's a little light-skinned, skinny black girl sitting outside her home with pigtails and tears in her eyes contemplating whether to take that rusty razor blade and slide it across her tiny wrist because she wants God to take her back home where, she loved, where she's loved. And suddenly, a butterfly lands. She stands and she walks inside to pick up art supplies. She draws tall trees with large branches where green, sour apples hang. She uses bright colors and shapes to reflect her love of birds and butterflies she survived another day in a world where she feels unwelcome. Today, she continues to fight, not just for herself, but for other black women. She fights for change because she believes humanity is worth saving. In closing, I leave you with these words from Oprah. Turn your wounds into wisdom and lift somebody up today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gloria. Last but not least, we have Vivian Scarlett. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Vivian Scarlett, founder and executive director of Dance Immersion. What a blessing to be here this evening with all these fantastic women. Um, what I wanted to do was start with a little movement thing, but that would take up my whole five minutes. So, <laughs> dance is what has, is the tool, the arts, and dance in particular, has the tool that has led me on the journey that I've been in. Dance Immersion is a presenter, producers. As a dancer choreographer myself, doing started off in ballet and jazz and was introduced to dances from Guinea, West Africa, which changed my life. It gave me more than just technique and movement, it gave me history. It gave me stories about myself and my people that no one else ever told me. And it led me on a journey of passion, strength, commitment, volunteerism, and loving myself, what I do, my people, despite what goes on around me. I grew up in a very small city called Brockville, Ontario, uh, just outside of Kingston. I was always, me and my family, there was six of us. You know, we were always the only black people. So whatever what was said, whatever what was done, our parents taught us that we can move through anything. They made sure that we were exposed to everything. We, it was mandatory in my family had to play a musical instrument. You know, no matter, just an instrument. It was the discipline and we also went to music lessons. We had to go to the city school that had the band. We had, my parents were trying to instill, with, instill in us the discipline that it takes to accomplish things. We went to, my father played in a country and western band. So we saw country, con, con, 
country and western, we went to opera, we went to everything, everything, so that the world is ours. You can accomplish anything out there. You know who you are. The, we teach you who you are. You know, but that is not what defines you. So on to my dance journey when I wanted to go to York University to take dance, my dad and my mom said no. Find something else, everybody else can dance. Music was okay, but dance was not. So they said go on, find something else, and get that little piece of paper, and then you can go on and do your dance. I went to Humber College and I took fashion careers because at the time I was doing disco fashion shows, so that was dance, so maybe I could get into dance that way. That two-year course did everything, designing, retailing, everything. I did it, went through, came out, went back to dance. Taking classes, ballet, jazz, all that stuff, and then was introduced to a West African dance class. Again, changed my life. That's what changed my life. But the courses that I took at Humber College when I ended up running a dance company assisted me so many ways. The designing costume, the accounting, we had to do all that kind of stuff. Started that. So I was dancing with Usafiri Dance and Drum Ensemble, which was founded by Kwame and Shani. Um, uh, Kwame Williams and Shani Mackenzie Brett um, didn't want to do it because I just wanted to dance. But she left me, when she left, she left me with this binder and said, Here, could you take over this company? I just wanted to dance. I didn't want to take on a company. So nothing happened for a while, but I missed it. I missed the singing, I missed the dancing, I missed the drumming. So I opened the binder, called people back together, and here we were. We were doing it, doing our thing, but want to get to the next level. Who else is going to take us? You knock on doors, there's all kinds of excuses, there's all kinds of things. Took off my dancing shoes and said, here we go. Went to DanceWorks Dance Ontario, their presenters in Toronto, and told them I had a vision to see us on stage doing who, what we do the way we want to do it. And they took me on, they mentored me, and that's how Dance Immersion started. Fast, we had our first presentation in 1995, realized that the community needed more than just the stage. We had to skill development, we had to resources, we need, there was so many things. We had to bring the youth in, we had those forums, talk about who we are, what we do, the business of what we do, and to bring it right back to the showcase so that we are building a circle that of, our, of what we do. Fast forward, kept going, so many things went through, but here we are right now in 2023. Succession. I'm all about succession. Over the years, we have worked with so many people. People come, people go, and this is the administration of the art of dance. So many things that are needed. So many things that have to come in. You, you bring people into your organization. You teach them. You show them. They show you. It's, you know, but then something happens. Not a lot of money in dance immersion. You know, there's a lot of money out there. So they leave. At first, it was so heart-wrenching, heartbreaking. How can I really do this again and go over? But yeah, you got to, you got to. Keep going and then as founder, you do everything, everything. And when you want to get, bring somebody in, you have to get all that everything out. And they're not gonna do everything the way you did everything because you're crazy, <laughs> you know? You're crazy. And then you're gonna do it all and want them to do it for $5. So how, you know, then I really had to start thinking because I didn't start dance immersion for me. Well, I did because I want to get on stage and dance, but that never happened. It's for us. How do we start to do this and how do we move it forward? Because it's more than just what we do. There's so much attached to it. Who comes to us? They come to us not with, well, I need a show, da, da, da. 
They come to you with, well, so-and-so told me this. They told me I should stop doing what I do. They, this was a racist, Sorry. <laughs> this was a racist thing that has been sent, said to me and I can't handle it. So there's so much succession. So what has happened over the years is I've built these little manuals. I've reached out to other organizations where people come and people go, there's some longevity to what we do. When I leave Dance Immersion, I'm planning I have my successor in place. You know, I have one more year mentoring, mentoring, you know, key, we need to keep it moving. It's wonderful that we have started these things, we do all these things, but what happens when we're gone? You know, so we have to keep moving. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you all um, for trying to make that into five minutes. I really appreciate it. I know it was tough. Um, I'm going to ask just one question and then we'll open it up to the audience for some audience questions. Um, just based on some takeaways, I'm so humbled to be here with all of you. Um, and something that Jacqueline said about not having um, people to look up to. I know me and Sarah, my co-curator for this exhibit, are very inspired by all of your work and your community leadership. And curating this exhibit means a lot for the representation of black women. And as Gloria said, um, we're not highlighted and all of your trailblazing is what allows youth like me and emerging curators who are coming up to do what we do now. And so I just want to know um, if you could elaborate on what this means to you um, as an exhibit and why this is so valuable and the importance of exhibits like this um, for our communities and for um, everyone at large. So. Yeah, and I, I am very inspired as Sandra is helping me find my voice by all of you <laughs> um, and your work. So that is my question in no specific order. <laughs> you want? I think for me, as someone who always on the front line, who's you know, I spent three months sleeping in a tent, you know, just to advocate for social issues, right? Um, for me to be here, to be recognized for the work that we're never work recognized mm -hmm. because we're there, you know, fighting the police, fighting, you know, for justice, right? So we never get that recognition. And for me, this is like, it's very empowering. Thank you. And thank you for including me <laughs> among all these Sorry. professional women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say so something. Um, for me, I am proud to be the first, but I do not want to be the only. Mm. Yes. So my inspiration, certainly for myself, I have certain goals that I want to reach. Being included in something like this is wonderful on a personal level, but it's also really important for me when I see these young ladies in the front row to know that it doesn't matter what you want to do. You know, you have to believe in yourself. You have to want to do it. And, and that's what this is about, showing that there is the possibility that it can happen, but you gotta make it happen. Yes. Uh, in my role as a Justice of the Peace, I really also continue to advocate for French-speaking people, because Canada is a bilingual country, so I've, that's, that was part of the racism that I've been going through all my life. And um, it, it worked because so many French-speaking black people were hired after me, and also English-speaking people. And in my region, I was the only uh, black person, and a second person came, and now there's eight of us. Mm -hmm. So wow. it makes a change. And this exhibit, for me, is um, it, it is so important to be able to showcase just us, just people, because every one of us here in this room have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And I learn every day from every single person, accused person that comes in front of me, I learn from them. And I let them know what I learned from them. And that is so important because that's the only way that we're gonna bring ourselves forward. I am learning to come out. Not just, oh yes, I've got this word, this word, this word, no. I was raped by the white man, blue eyes. 
and I'm here today standing in front of you. And now I have the power and the voice to say it in public. Um, I'd just like to say how important it is to open the door to someone and give them an opportunity. And I think I mentioned uh, briefly when I was at Hope Run Through and bringing another person up and a person of color um, that did an exemplary job. It's really important to lift someone else up and not just to stay in your position and think, well, I've made it, but open the door uh, for someone else. And as uh, the other lady said, you may be the first, but you won't be the last. So open up those doors, uh, help people, uh, be open to you know, talking about uh, how they can excel and you know, if you have any connections to share them. I think it's really important to share. Um, last, uh, about three weeks ago, I was really honored to uh, be part of a national webinar that went right across Canada and all the Hope Renfrew employees in every um, store got to hear a little bit about my uh, journey and how important it is to have a diverse and inclusive workplace. So again, bring someone along on the journey with you. It's very important. Um, well, for me, the, I think seeing um, all these photographs in this room, I feel there's a legacy here that um, this generation or some of us, um, all of us are leaving for the next generation that, that is coming forward. I feel that it's time um, that we um, as black women should be recognized and be your role models for everyone else. Because if they don't have this, if they don't have this history, they never have, will have someone to follow or to say, oh, she did it. So I can also become this. I can work at Oak Rent View. I can be the judge. I can be this, you know? I can be the entrepreneur that started Dance Immersion or Tulsi Pathway. And um, because I think sometimes some of our kids are lost, you know, not uh, being able to make decisions. And I think by, I took my, my nieces and nephews so they could see these women and I spoke about them individually. So I think that's really important. Um, that, that's for me what I see up there. And that's what I would like the young people to see and to document. Because if we don't write these things down, if we don't talk about them, you're not going to have them. Who are you going to do? Uh, do an essay on a, a, a black woman um, in Toronto. If it's not there, you won't be able to have the history. And that's, for me, that's what's important for them to follow that. And for parents to see that so they can say, but remember that woman, she spoke about being this. So maybe you could do that. Also, so for me, it's for young women and young men um, that for them to see and recognize and read about us. For moi, je suis vraiment fière d'être ici. But I'm also proud of all of these other women who are on the panel with me, and I think it's important that we are coming from such divergent backgrounds. Um, I happened to see something on TV and there were five black women featured in five separate black, five separate commercials. And I was thinking this never happened when I was a little kid. If I saw someone black on TV, I would, we would be phoning each other across the city. <laughs> Did you see um, a black model? Did you see a little ad for a split second in the background? Um, but those are fleeting images, and as much as they make you, they, they provide the representation in the moment, something like this provides representation that will have a greater um, shelf life. 
Um, it does, as you already said, it will provide um, the community with the opportunity to access images and stories about people of a, uh, from the diverse African-Canadian community. And so I'm very proud to be part of this, and I would like to, to thank those people who work to make this happen, um, from the City of Toronto Archives, from BAND, uh, because without their working together, I suspect this wouldn't have happened for another couple of years. So thank you. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I th think we have some time for audience questions. Um, making sure that whatever company uh, you're working with, that they understand. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> that, that they understand that you deserve to be in the space, and also that they're um, they're conscious of uh, you as a minority, um, that you can feel empowered and. Uh, able to speak to someone if uh, you um, if you experienced uh, any sort of racism uh, without retribution you know a lot of times people are afraid to go into uh, human resources for instance and um, uh, explain a situation because they feel they won't be listened to they won't be heard so I, I think uh, it's important for companies to have a dialogue to have um, sensitivity training for people from visible minorities, uh, it's very, very important. And you know, we all need allies, and uh, I think it's important in a lot of companies to open that door and make um, people feel comfortable. But the other thing is you have to get in the door, so don't think that you're not capable. As Sandra was saying, you can do anything you want to do. And you have to feel, as I was saying, you belong in those spaces. So especially today, I mean, it's so much easier now when you think of the civil rights movement or 30, 40 years ago. Look, I was the only black child in the school for most of my life. And I didn't, it didn't uh, hinder me. I tried out for cheerleading. I, choreographed fashion shows at, uh, in high school. So you belong in those spaces and uh, feel empowered that you, you can be there and you can excel and take all those opportunities. I, I love, love that question. <laughs> I now work uh, with Olivia Chow at Institute for Change Leaders. And the program is just about that. How to organize for change to move yourself forward. And it's about learning to tell your story to make change. And then when you have your story, you find your allies, you find people to organize and sit down and know who is an ally, who is for you, who not for you, how you're going to change them, what are you going to tell the story? Amazing that we, we have to learn how to organize. Some people think, oh, everybody gets up and you put up the sign and you go out on the street and those parts are important. But before you get to the sign and the putting on the social media, who are you trying to reach? Who has the power to help you make the change? How do you access them? What stories do you tell? Girl, take the course. <laughs> it's at TMU. To, to both young ladies for your question, and this is my personal opinion, so it may not resonate with everyone, but I know that for myself when I was younger, being the only person, the only kid in the school, the only person in the meeting, etc., there were no, ally, no allies, and it's very difficult to speak. As it stands right now, we have to use our voice because 
my analogy is the window has opened up. We have always been saying the same things as black people, as people of color, as people who are racialized. Nothing is new. The difference being now is that, especially since George Floyd, the window opened up and people are willing to listen to our message. They're willing to listen to our story and, and actually hear the words and understand it. So the challenge, the challenge is, is how do you do it? But regardless of how, whatever the methodology is, just remember, we have always been felt to feel, we have been comfortable with being uncomfortable. We have been the ones who are like, oh, I don't want to create a, 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 you know, I don't want to say anything because the recrimination comes back on us. So, Some what, Some. so however the message is going to be out there, I think that it's really important that you find your voice and speak um, in whatever way you feel comfortable. Uh, I know for myself in my corporate environment, and also too because I'm just a couple of years away from, from retirement, I'm not as concerned about recrimination, about suffering, for my career, so I feel it's my duty to speak for the younger folks who are concerned about those things and maybe don't want to speak up. But there are definitely, you know, you can't allow anybody to fire you or hold you back from jobs or anything like that, but you will probably still, there's probably still a battle on your hands. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's important for us to speak now. Sometimes you have to repeat yourself over and over and over and over again like a broken record. I've sat in committees where they're all white, they all say, oh, we don't know. I said, have you advertised in this newspaper for the job? Oh, the stats are this for the French-speaking people, blah, blah, blah. I said, yes, but have you thought of advertising in over here and over there. I said that like five years in a row to the people because they always had stats and I didn't mind. I said, well, I'm gonna repeat myself again. I remember seeing that last year, the year before, and the year before. But until you advertise in the right places, then you will realize that you will have so many qualified black French speaking people. You will up your stats French, you will up your stat diversity, and you will have the competent people doing the job. Repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, Along okay. with, sorry, can I? Sorry. You go ahead. Okay. Along with repeating yourself, there's a whole table here of women. You come across, you know there's things on social media, whatever it is. There are people, that is their job. So as we grow and we multiply, you know there are people, there's the advocacy people, that's what they do. So make sure you seek those people, you know who they are call them, you know, they can say yes or no, but their job is to say yes because that's what they're, they're, they say they're going to do. We, we must know that we're not alone. We have in the masses of us, and when we work together and move forward, you know, we gotta make the change. We want, we want to be and say and do the change that we want to see. Okay. My thing is, I'm an artist. I create art to disrupt, mm -hmm. to you know, uh, uh, make people, uh, uh, sometimes you don't have the voice, you don't have the words, but you always have the art. So you create art, and art brings people together. So if you don't have the words, you don't have the people, create art, art upsets, art makes changes. So. The other thing um, I would like to suggest is uh, seek out a mentor. Um, um, in the United States, uh, I've lived in both places, in the United States, um, kids have mentor, adults have mentor. Um, I would hear adults say, oh yeah, she's my mentor, and I'm thinking like, what, you're 40, what, you're 60? <laughs> no, you seek a mentor out there. It's very popular in the United States. People have mentored, they change mentor because they go to university or because they're in a career and so forth. So seek someone out who you can connect with the advocacy that Vivian just speak, spoke about. Um, so you can connect with that person, ask question. I mentor several kids, you know, young people, and um, you know, someone you're gonna have coffee with and talk about. But they're doing this at my school, and I would like, you know, so someone else always has something else to advise or to suggest to you. So seek someone out, whether it's someone two years older than you or, uh, you know, an auntie, a community member, seek people out. It's really helpful on your path.
I have three children, and I would say that the advice that I gave each of my three children was the same. Um, girls are no less um, subject to some of the issues that happen in the street than boys are. And I think that they have to be aware, um, no matter as much as we talk about everybody's the same and there's equal, bleh, they have to know that they may well not be treated the same as other people. They have to know that that's going to happen on the street, it's going to happen when they're shopping, it's going to happen in school, not because we have a chip on our shoulder, not because we are looking for trouble, but because the reality is there are going to be times when you are going to find yourself in a situation where there is no other factor for you being singled out than possibly your race. And what happens when that, that happens? To know, number one, who you are, to know your value, and to know how best you should react in the situation in order to protect yourself in the moment. And then whatever you choose to do after the fact is something completely separate. And, um, and I think you know that question, I just have to say that <laughs> We have this idea that things only happen to kids or little boys and little girls. Things happen to all of us. Things have, have happened to babysitters leaving my home. Things have happened to me. And it isn't because you're wearing a hoodie and it isn't because you're looking threatening. It's because we are in a society where sometimes people who are not part of what is perceived as the majority are not treated fairly or equitably or reasonably. So it isn't about not accepting that, it's about accepting that, it's about knowing that, it's about being alert to when you have to react in a particular way, and it's about what you need to do to protect yourself in the moment. My grandson's 25, he was driving in a car with a white guy and a white girl. He wasn't driving, he was in the back seat. They stopped him, they arrested my grandson, and, and let the this is, uh, sorry, skip the dishes. Um, <laughs> they arrested my grandson and they let the white couple go. So you have to understand, and I, he did what I, I always tell him, when a cop stop you, don't get rude, I know you're upset, just be polite. But he still got arrested. And he asked me, he said, but Granny, why did, didn't they arrest those two? I said, because they're white, mm -hmm. you're not. Can I talk about ageism a minute over here? Let me just, <laughs> Lord, I'm an artist. In the city of Toronto, there aren't a lot of older black women abstract artists. So when I go into a, a space where I don't see anyone who looks like me, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I go in, I see a wall, I want, my art goes there. It's like you don't ask, you tell them where you're gonna put it. You have to go in with confidence, you can't let, Someone who does, just because you don't see yourself there, mm -hmm. you can't stop that. You have to, you know, just have faith in yourself. You belong. Yeah, you belong there. You belong wherever you want to go, girl. <laughs> One word, okay. persistence. Persist yes. mm -hmm. Just keep on. Mm -hmm. Stickies on, stick, stick some sticky, yellow stickies on all their faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all the, st label yeah. them. Bully, yeah. bully, bully, bully. Oh, and stick it to them. And sometimes you've got, to, you've got to name it. You've got, you've got to ask the question, are you reacting in this way because of my age? Or, you know, or, you know Dr. Siegel, I think he says, you have to name it to tame it. Once you name that, then you put it out there, and then when people are responding to you the next time, they will, right? And then you will be stronger, right? Because you keep naming it and saying, are you doing this because? Just, I'm just asking a question. You, you can't let someone else's ignorance stop you, mm -hmm. right? First and foremost. So maybe the next time this person says to you, do I know you? I've met you many times. My name is so-and-so. Right. I'd like you to respect me. You know, you can say things in a nice way, but let them know that you, you realize what they're doing and it's, it's, you know, it's not acceptable, right? Maybe you could go to human resources 
and just have a meeting and say, you know, this makes me feel so and so, I've been here for many years, and maybe they could speak to the person. But I work as a stylist. Um, many years ago, the look that they wanted in the catalogs were what they called all American, which meant blonde, blue eyes. Blue eyes. Barbie. Like, you know, Barbie. black people weren't American or Canadian because the Canadian catalogs followed the same. And slowly there's been huge change. Um, if you look in other, uh, a lot of publications, you'll see many, many beautiful dark-skinned <coughs> men and women. That's almost become a trend. What happens in fashion, unfortunately, sometimes this diverse uh, uh, sort of uh, the diverse movement becomes a trend, and that's bad because there's been times many years ago in the 90s, for instance, uh, Italian Vogue did an all black issue because a lot of the black uh, models uh, were speaking out and they were saying, why is it on the runway? It's all of this <coughs> Eastern European look. And they did a whole issue where every single page was um, a black model. And then it fell down, and then it came up again. But people are speaking up. There's a woman named Beth Ann Hardison that was at the forefront of creating an agency uh, with more black representation and spoke out to all the designers. And it's, it's an ongoing thing, but I think you have to use your voice. And, um, you know, I don't know what company you're with, but they're really missing out because if they look in all the top fashion publications, it's, the hue is, right now, actually, the most important models are darker skinned ones, actually. So I think if you want a career in fashion, you can't let these microaggressions stop you, but feel free to speak and say that, you know, I feel disrespected. Um, ask questions. Well, why don't we have uh, some darker skinned uh, pe people that are part of the population and, you know, look what they're doing in Vogue and Bazaar and ID magazine and, and things like that. But if you want your career, I mean, look at me. I was the only black woman in, in spaces Imagine being in Paris and there's 1,000 people at a huge dinner that they had for uh, a big designer and you're the only black person. I kept my head high because you, you have to feel that you belong in those spaces. Do you know what I mean? And so find an ally. I'm sure there's someone in your company that um, you can speak to. I know a lot of times there are promotions and you, you, know, you feel you're left behind and you deserve this, but you have to fight for it and, and not um, give up and just show them you know, what you're all about. I'm not the type of person to have my own company. I'm a great employee. I like working for somebody so that when work is done, I can go do what I want to do. But having said that, that's because I know that's what I'm about. I've been in fitness and people are always like, oh, why don't you open up your own gym? You're so great. No, because I like doing that. I don't want to run the business. That being said, there are other people who are driven by creating something, developing something, growing something, producing something. So in my opinion, that answer comes from you. You decide what you want to do and how you want to do it. If I could add to that, Jordan, the problem is not creating our own businesses. I help so many, I, I help over 100 people opening their business in Ontario, black people, newcomers. I invite you to speak to my husband and his partner tonight. They're he's starting his own business. Our problem is our unity. You want to open a restaurant? Oh, it's going to be a Haitian restaurant, so it's you know, we have a, like the hot pepper like this and this and this and that. If you don't cater your Haitian restaurant to the rest of the world, you're not going to get Haitians to come and eat at your Haitian restaurant. That's period, bottom line. So the Chinese did it. You've got Chinatown everywhere you go. In every country you go, you have Chinatown. Even in China, I've been there. <laughs> right? I went to Chinatown in China. Exactly. I did. <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't have little little Ghana or little Haiti or little black town, little black like we, we had we, we, we had Eglinton. <laughs> it's still it's, it's still alive. Yeah, yeah, little Jamaica still oh, alive. Yeah. We had Eglinton. What happened to Eglinton? It's exactly. But we're, what, we're what, still we're there. Yeah. <laughs> and what happened to our black um, union bank? We have a lot to do. Unity. Unity. And unity is not only us. Black people, I see a few white people here. Like, I'm so happy to see you guys here. Other cultures. Unity. We need to love ourselves first and support ourselves. But it's also has to come from... It, it also has to come from you. I think that being an entrepreneur is great if you are ready to do it if you know what you want to do. Um, my entrepreneurships that I've done have always been my passion. It's always something that I wanted to do. And um, it, I, I didn't care what was going on around there, out there, up there, whatever. I wanted to do this. I figured out to do it. Like Sandra was saying the, uh, earlier on, how do you do that? Get a book, talk to somebody. <clears throat> fix it up and, and move with it. Also, so, the Black Business and Professional Association, there you go. please go and they understand. understand. They're doing a lot of work yeah. to assist entrepreneurs and work with people who have ideas. Yeah. So please make, so, we have lots of resources that people don't yeah. use. So Fascinates can, me, so you're right. Yeah, you can either do, like I like working for the man too. I'm, I'm fine, you know. Nine to five, well, it's longer than that, but you know, nine to five, go home, Get I know paycheck. there's a paying check, pay my bills, I'm happy, go to the movie on the weekend, go partying, I'm happy. But I live my passion because I've ran several entrepreneurship because that's what I wanted to do. What do you want to do? And figure out, Black Business Association, I have this, I want to know how to turn it into a business. Okay, Thank and when I, and I'm one of those persons. I started, and after a while, I'm giving Thank it back you, to Mabinti. someone else. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move with thing. it. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I just want to say much. there's all kinds of black, young, successful people around <laughs> in Toronto. Yeah. They're doing very well. Uh, George Sully, that started his shoe company. There's so many, and you know, you can uh, read about them and reach out to them. So if you want to open your own um, company and you've done your research and you've got a business plan and you really thought about it, so you can do it. I, I think you should do it. But you've got to do it in the right way. But there's lots of success stories. Thank you all so much for being here and for offering your time.